Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious. Being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Maurizio Benazzo. My name is Aya Benazzo, and welcome everyone. Very nice to have you here. Yes. And welcome, Francis. Welcome, Francis. We've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. So, <laughs> yeah. as you will feel, we're really excited. Yes, this. yes. So, we, we live... Uh, here in uh, the coastal Milwaukee and Southern Pomo land, now so, called uh, no, Northern Sebast California, Sebastopol. And uh, yeah, we are the people who put together sand 15 years ago, but that's completely irrelevant at this point because what's relevant is that we have Francis here. And I want to read a brief bio, very brief, because we want to jump in into the beauty of hearing. I mean, I'm so, super excited, but. Does he show? <laughs> I'm super excited to share, to introduce you. So let me let me say, Francis Weller, MFT, is a psychotherapist, writer, and soul activist that offers educational programs that seeks to integrate the wisdom from indigenous cultures with the insight and knowledge gathered from Western poetic, psychological, and spiritual traditions. And Francis. If you feel inspired to maybe before we go into a conversation to share any poem or any anything that will bring us fully here. To well, well, first, thank you for inviting me to be here with you and for all of you for joining us today. Um, I think the really small little poem that that uh, pops into my mind is the one that I frequently share. It's um, by Denise Levertov. She said, to speak of sorrow works upon it, moves it from its crouched place, barring the way to and from the soul's hall. So for us to feel the depth of our life, to feel into the soulfulness of our life. We need to be fluent in the language of soul. To speak of sorrow works upon it, moves it from its crouched place, barring the way to and from the soul's fall. So if we can't speak about our sorrow, if we can't touch the corridors of our grief, then our relationship to soul is deeply, deeply limited and damaged. So... I'm glad we're here to talk about grief and loss and emptiness and all kinds of marvelous topics today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, maybe let's begin with emptiness, since this was the, the topic of our conversation for today. So emptiness or wholeness or that persists, especially in modernity, in modern society, what are the roots of that sense of emptiness? Where would you trace that? How would you trace the roots of? Uh, yeah, that's a, a core question, isn't it? How, how do we come to be in this situation? And not that I'm a historian or that I have a fully understood, but I think there are many tributaries to this feeling of emptiness. The most uh, primal one we could say is the loss of relationship between the human and the more than human world uh, that we we began to this this uh, separation from the living earth uh, some thousands of years ago with the migration from hunting gathering and living in tribal community to agricultural life and that per se wasn't damaging but the consequences of that severance have been damaging. As we became more and more uh, fixated on structure and, and uh, power dynamics, 
domestication becomes a consequence of how you treat the plant, but also how you treat the animal and how you treat the wild. Suddenly you're in a, con uh, a contrarian relationship to the world. And we began this severance, this beginning with what Charles Glendening, the uh, eco-psychologist, calls the original trauma, was this severance, this tear in the cosmological code of our belonging to the to the earth, to the world. And then there are other tributaries. Uh, we could say that um, the rise of individualism has had a profound impact, particularly in white uh, culture, that emphasizes more and more on, on the individual and less and less on communal belonging, less and less on a sense of participatory consciousness, but more on the singular experience of consciousness. Who am I? Rather than who am I in relationship to the world? And as community began to fade and as the sense of entanglement with elk and bison and salmon and cricket all began to diminish in our imaginations and our minds, we became more and more kind of uh, centered on our own being. And we lost the world. We lost the world. We also lost body. Morris Berman wrote a, a very powerful book many years ago called uh, Coming to Our Senses. And he tracks, and the subtitle is The Hidden History of the Body in the West. And how has the body faded from our sensual attention, our erotic involvement with sunlight and wind and rain and music and dance and so as these things begin to fade, we are reduced from what I call our original identity, which is massive. Our original identity arises out of mystery, comes into this body, embedded in a family system, hopefully. That family system is embedded in the living community of culture. That living culture has active practices of initiation that bring you into a living relationship to the wider world which establishes a bond with the living cosmos. That's our original identity. That's how big we were meant to be. We were meant to be cosmos dreaming. We were meant to be cosmos singing, weeping, sharing dreams together. We were supposed to be this large entity. And we've lost cosmos. We've lost clan life. We've lost community mostly. Families are very isolated and disconnected. Frequently what we end up with just is just me. A singular individual bouncing off other singular individuals, rarely feeling the rich tapestry of belonging and participation. And so that emptiness that arises out of, out of this profound absence of what it is that the psyche, the soul expected, is something that we're sitting with right now. Uh, profound feelings of emptiness, which we often blame ourselves for. Like, what did I do wrong? I mean, I hear this all the time in my practice as a therapist for 40 years. I feel empty inside. And I certainly felt my own emptiness. And you do this deep scrutiny, right? You go, What's, what did I fail to do? What did I do wrong? But as I sit with grief for decades now, you begin to see that what's wrong is that the culture has failed to give us what it is that we need to feel contented here. It's as if the structures that we live in are designed to keep us chronically discontent. And that's how you keep capitalism going. And we can jump into that whole thing too, but I'll stop for that for now. But that's some of the causes of this emptiness. Yeah, so many threads to fall. Um, let's see. We were... Recently, uh, in the border of France and Spain, visiting a village that in 1400, the um, Inquisition actually started there. And they killed over a thousand so-called witches. And these were people, not just women, who were living deeply connected to nature, to herbs, oh, to yeah. freedom of life. And so I'm... Um, very much like when you said original trauma, like I'm just often trying to trace where did this started, which it's hard. It's hard to point, pinpoint to a specific time or moment. But I often wonder if that disconnect came also with the, the rise of religions where God became 
outside of life. And for a lot of indigenous, for all indigenous cultures, God is part of life, is, is the tree, is the pig, is the, it is not. A, so if, if you have anything to say, if you see this connection, maybe as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, successive traumatic invasions, right? I mean, that's what we witnessed, particularly in the European, well, all around the planet afterwards. But the successive invasions of the Roman culture, first of all, which dislodged indigenous practices to a great deal for most European people, followed by the invasion of a religious system that further alienated the relationship and intimacy between people and place, between the mythology, the, the living presence in that land. So this has been going on for, like I say, quite a few thousands of years, and one of its keynotes, one of its hallmarks is domination, is control. So, and, and oppression, that uh, when we live in a relational field and the primary satisfactions are met for belonging, for participation, for connection to nature, for all the ritual life that we need, we don't want to go out and control and dominate others. So this kind of domination is symptomatic, isn't it? It, it speaks to a, a tremendous uh, breach in the continuum of participation and belonging. Mm. This is where we could begin to sense that the emergence of what uh, Jack Forbes talks about in his book, Columbus and Other Cannibals, about the Wetico disease which he describes as cannibalistic psychosis. So that's that's a powerful term, right? I mean, and that's exactly what we have become, kind of a cannibalistic energy where we can never be satisfied. We want, we eat, we eat, we eat, whether that's human beings or uh, minerals or anything. We consume voraciously and that hunger is never appeased. I've worked with a lot of very wealthy people, and what I hear from them frequently, I'll, I'll never have enough. There will never be enough. So I know we started with uh, the Inquisition and ended up uh, with this talk about uh, this persistent hunger that's here, that we can't abate. We cannot um, uh, mitigate this hunger by following what I call secondary satisfactions. You know, power, rank, privilege, wealth, um, supremacies of all kinds, whether that's over other bodies or other, other colors or other genders or whatever it is, this will never satisfy anything. But these are the primary values of white Western culture. Success, achievement, power, rank, privilege. We put these up as values rather than failures. We put them up as values rather than symptoms of a great forgetting of how to be one among many and to live here reverentially and to live here respectfully and uh, to be a, a, a participant in the dance, but not dominating the dance. Yeah, and and the where where we have being led to or we uh, today to try to look for solution is in the self through self help mm -hmm. industry and psychotherapy or now actually we have a little um our film the wisdom of trauma which addresses very much trauma the focus is on individual level and that also can hurt us when we take it as my fault or my emptiness that yeah. I have to do something to yeah, fix. Just, and yeah. if I do enough therapy, maybe one day I will, as an individual. So you speak beautifully about this paradox of because we have been led to feel a separate individual and we have been given tools of the psychotherapy to heal and that it kind of perpetuates the emptiness in some way and leads to what we see today in so many mental health issues and addictions and 
it looks, it feels like a vicious circle. circle. Yeah. Yeah, I think when I sit with somebody, the, the primary premise is that sense of of flaw or defect, the feeling of shame. And we could say that shame is also one of those, well, let me back up just for a second, this emptiness that we often feel inside is not neutral. It's not, in other words, it's it's not just that, oh, I feel empty. That that emptiness is gravitationally drawing to it shame and feelings of rage. You know, so what's drawn to that emptiness, into that hole, into that black hole of, of uh, the vortex of that, is a lot of shame. And so when people come to my office, uh, the lament is, well, how do I repair myself to be adequate enough to go back and be acceptable? So the premise is based oftentimes on, on self-hatred, that who I am is so flawed and so defective that I have to do this repair job in order to be you know, provisionally let back out into the into the world. But I can't agree with that as a premise. So I don't go there with people. I, I refuse to go there. Psyche will never participate in a job that's based on self hatred. It won't it won't do it. So the 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 benefits of beginning to understand that the context for this wound that I'm carrying is not personal. It's both ancestral and it's cultural. The wounds that I carry in my being, as Rumi would say, began in some other tavern. You know, it began a long time ago. I'm the current curator of this, mm -hmm. and I have I have to attend to it and work with it creatively, imaginatively, communally. Like when someone comes in, I often say to them, this is a good place to learn how to tolerate contact and how to come into touch with your deepest grief. But the holding space that you require for healing, this room is way too small. At some point, you'll need to enter back into community where the real work of healing occurs. And I use the word healing provisionally because it's not about trying to fix or repair something, but to restore something. To restore that, that primal requirement for participation and for engagement and for belonging. Um, and that's what so much of what we doubt that we have the right to, you know, that the wounds that come in the door are almost always about belonging. And you can't, you can't repair that by fashioning up a better persona. You can't look better to get that resolved in your bones. That has to come through the actual encounter in the depths of our experience, usually on our knees usually crying together. And then the suturing can begin. I can begin to feel my coat stitched to your coat and to their coat. And that wholeness can begin to be felt again. Does that make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the first value or the primary value when a child is born in an individual community is to make them... To, to install the sense of belonging through many different practices. And right. it's like here in this world, we have to fight to belong or prove that we are worthy of belonging. That goes back again to that self unworthiness. Like I'm not a worthy to belong. Yeah. That, that wounding, it's, it, it's so painful. The, the grief when I touch that is so enormous that. I can see how we want to move, look avoid away, it. avoid it, because yes. it's enormous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think if we really stopped and recognized how alone we feel and how un, at times unworthy we feel of belonging, we would weep for a thousand years. And again, that began a long time ago. It's not my current experience that began now. It began generations and generations ago. But that doesn't mean we're not responsible for addressing it now. We are. We have to. And the, it, the failure of addressing this issue around emptiness is basically will be the annihilation of all sustainability for this planet. Because, yeah. you know, the symptoms are, are very clear that we are 
outstripping this world, that our chronic hunger for more, and most of the more that we want is crap. You know, this hunger that we have is insatiable. And unless we address this issue, we will, we will, we're on a suicide track right now. And that's, it's unstoppable if we don't address this core question around emptiness, I think is so fundamental. I was at a, um, a gathering working on race relationships and the, the room was very heated, as you can imagine. And it needs that heat is necessary. And we were going around sharing what, what was on our hearts. What were we walking in with? And I said, well, the thing I'm tracking most is the layers of emptiness uh, in my in, in white culture. And a black man literally leapt off his chair and pointed at me and said, that's it. Until your people address that issue, you'll continue to steal from us and kill us every fucking day. And that was like this imprint in my being, like, okay, that's my job. I have to track this. I have to find out what's at the heart of it. That's why I call, that's why I call this at the heart of all our sorrows. I mean, we have all of our sorrow. We have earth sorrow. We have you know, personal losses. We have you know the wounds that we experience in our own lives and ancestral grief. But what's what is it that ties so much of this together? Is this un, unrelenting wound around belonging and emptiness? And I just feel that this is crucial to our to our conversation in these days. How do we address something in a manner that we've basically forgotten how to address? Do you get what I'm saying? In other words, the approach that we take to it psychologically and collectively is to avoid the emptiness. We're very big on talking about abundance. We're very big on talking about happiness. Not bad things. Abundance is great. Happiness is wonderful. But we're missing something in the room, which is this great hole that we should be weeping over, that we have forgotten the primary satisfactions. We've forgotten what it is the soul yearns for, what shaped us over 300,000 years of evolution wasn't more it was shared it wasn't mine it was ours you know so the, the, the premises that we have to come back to are so critical and the irony is that we've forgotten those primary needs and so we keep relentlessly pursuing the secondary needs like any addict you know we can never have enough of what you don't need you know that's you just want more and more more is the uh operative word always more always more more land if you're an empire more drugs if you're an addict more money if you're but it's always more so there's no sense of that sense of uh, satisfaction you know yeah. and once you and, and that's the really the beginning of the journey for me personally the understanding the satisfaction and the gratitude for every moment and for all i have is the beginning is my has been my door my portal towards this uh, mm. towards your, what you are describing mm. it just has been the way in which i realize okay i have everything and and then i realize how separate i am from everything else around me you know from the plants from the birds from people yeah and grief and emptiness so <laughs> Is running away from grief what builds the sense of emptiness? And how do we begin metabolize both the emptiness? Can we metabolize the emptiness or we uh, open towards the grief? How, how, what is, I hate questions, how? <laughs> <laughs> you choose. Yeah. I don't want to go you there. Can be, so I can yeah. get more. Right. So the, the uh, rich language even is such a trap. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, that's the thing about our, our kind of a, our binary language. The opposite of emptiness must be fullness. Uh, well, it's not. It's not. The opposite of emptiness is relationship. Mm -hmm. The opposite of emptiness is embeddedness. You know, so it isn't about, again, what can I gather? 
But how can I participate? How can I restore all my relations? You know, uh, that language of all my relationships is, you know, that's a very familiar uh, phrase from Lakota language and others, but we can't think of the repair of this in isolation. How will I do this? But how will we remember together what the trail on the ground looked like? That we actually can't do this in a, in a partitioned way off by myself. My restoration of, of belonging is not an interior job. It's a relational job. I was going to bed once uh, a couple of years ago, right at the 2020 elections were happening, and I was very depressed. Um, didn't know what to expect, but my expectations were not positive. They were you know, pretty fearful of what we were about to do here in the United States. And I was about to get into bed and something turned my body completely around, walked me over to my bookshelf and pulled a book uh, off the shelf by uh, Linda Hogan, the Chickata Chickasaw elder and writer. And the book was called Dwellings beautiful collection of essays of hers. And I opened the book to the chapter, All My Relations. And I realized in that moment of despair, I had forgotten all my relations. I was isolated. I was singular. I was solitary. And I had no sense of potency. So I began to extend my feelings of connections to the stars and to the redwoods outside my door and to the turtles and to the salmon and you know, to the lichen, and, and suddenly the despair just phew, gone. So when we remember all our relationships, when we come back into communion, we begin to live within primary satisfactions. Mm -hmm. We begin to address what the soul really needs. You know, we have more belongings, but we don't feel like we belong. You know, we have so much stuff but we don't feel full. We don't feel satisfied. So we must be barking up the wrong tree here, you know. Or as my one of my mentors said, we, yeah, we we climb the ladder of success only to realize we're leaning against the wrong building, you know. So you, we can get up to the top of the, of that power structure or the money structure, but emptiness is waiting for us there. Emptiness is waiting for us everywhere until we turn to meet it and understand what the soul is yearning for inside that emptiness. James Hillman, one of my primary teachers said, in your symptoms are your soul's deepest desires. In your symptoms are your soul's deepest desires. So what if inside of this emptiness is a desire for return? Is a desire, I think as, sure, as we were gathering this morning before we started recording, this phrase came to my mind walking the other day about remembering forward. How do we take what shaped us over thousands and thousands of years and generations that gave shape to our being psychically and physically, emotionally, spiritually, soulfully? How do we bring that remembrance, what Carl Jung called the unforgotten wisdom at the core of the psyche, how do we bring that into this moment and begin to live in that kind of uh, fidelity and relationship to the larger world and to one another? We're not going to do this as single individuals. It's not possible. It's not possible. Yeah, and I, I love that. Uh, there is another thing we've done as well, that that relationality we have turned into relationship, which also has become a thing, not a living, not a... Like, I I almost like more relating or really than than building relationships there's something in that as well that perpetuates that sense of separateness or uh no that's good that's really right on uh so what we could also bring into this then is the imagination of the third body mm -hmm. the third body is the space between us so whether that's between me and the doug fur outside here or between me and the bumblebee or the honeybees or the, you know, the zinnias that are just riotously blooming right now. 
It's the space between us that is most alive. Not you and me, but what's, what's between us. And we serve that. We serve the love between us. We, we serve the space between us. So it isn't a possession. It isn't something I, you know, either am in control of or subservient to. But in that space between us, what uh, Henry Corbin, the philosopher, called the interworld, that's where we're most alive. That's where soul is exchanged. A wonderful phrase from the alchemist Michael Sendivogius, who said, the, the greater part of the soul lies outside the body. So we're having this moment, even though it's technological, because the overlap between us is being touched. The space between us, there's something soulful in the exchange by what's happening between us, not me to you and you to me in binary modalities, but in a, in a third, in a third function. And that you don't possess, that's what you serve. You serve the love between you and the world, between you and a friend, between you and a child. And that's the, I, I love the imagery of the third body. Yeah, yeah, never heard that, but yeah. Yeah, and it's not only the third, but it's not only literally between us, it's not, but it's all around us. It's the That's human. right, that's right. It's, it's, we, are embedded. we are embedded, yeah. And, and, you, and you can cultivate a third body. You know, when typically when people show up in my office as a couple, it's because the third body has been, yes. you know, is emaciated, it's starving, it hasn't been fed. And it isn't about better communication skills, and that doesn't hurt. And it's not about improving your sex life. It's about how do I nourish this third body? How do I serve something greater than my own wounded needs? But that takes us back to the emptiness. As long as there's an emptiness, I'm going to feel constantly in hunger for your giving to me. And so we become much more focused on need than on feed. You know, how do I feed this? space between the two of us, what gestures of kindness, of attention, of affection, of remembrance, of care, of kindness. And again, not just between humans, mm -hmm. but between us and the, and the larger world. Anything that you come into a deep relationship with, you can cultivate a third body. If you have a place in your world that you love and you go back there, bring gifts. Bring something to this space. And say, thank you for being here, for holding me when I'm here, for witnessing me and my grief, for my joy, my gratitude. You know, we have to live in a much more reciprocal relationship to the world around us. This is as if my participation matters. As if the world actually notices that I am tending to this and is fed by this. For many, many years, we did a ritual called the gratitude for all that is and it begins in um with some grief you know acknowledging the state of the world the, the suffering of the world but then over the course of three days we, we build this momentum to do this gratitude ritual where we build these beautiful grottos and children and everyone climbs into these grottos to bring offerings of flower petals and cornmeal and tobacco and agates that we've gathered and then we take that out into the world and an opening has been made in the earth. And for one day, we feed her body. We make clay figurines and the children put all of these things into the earth. And it's a bittersweet moment of great joy and great grief that, you know, we know how much she is suffering right now. But for this moment, please accept this small little offer from our feeble bodies in our little community, saying thank you, right? Grateful for all that is, you know. And I'm still exceedingly grateful for all that is. The world is still gorgeous and stunning. And yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. And there's something about taking both the bitter and the sweetness and not having, the again, the the preference right. towards the sweetness or towards the joy or the happiness. We we strive for happiness, but we don't even know what happiness is. 
So living, how do we live with both the grief, but also the joy of existence, yeah. living, not all, beyond all conditioning? And Yeah, no, that's a really important question. I think one of the first moves we have to make is to begin to feel that grief isn't here to take us hostage. It's, it's, you know, we have so little faith in grief that it's a place safe enough to walk into. And I can tell you how often in my office um, people say things, something like, well, you know, when grief arrives in the door, they say, if I go there, I'm never coming back, you know. There's tremendous fear of grief. And they say, well, if you don't go there, you're never coming back. Because so much of our life force is locked up in the resistance to grief, the avoidance of grief. And there is no true happiness. There is certainly no true joy, I don't think, if we shut off the lower register of grief. You know, I spent some time in West Africa in a little village, and um, there was a woman there, and I walked up to her, and I just had to say, you have so much joy. And you know what her response was? Well, that's because I cry a lot. I mean, how un-American is that? I mean, <laughs> uh, not because I shop a lot or I, you know, I've got a, you know, great, uh, I, you know, four hundred and one k plan. It had to do with her sorrow. That when that lower register is open, when we can we can drop into that and hear the resonant bell at that deep place, then the possibilities of hearing the joyful chorus join in, that becomes possible. But you can't have one without the other. You know? I forgot your questions. <laughs> no, you answered. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. And and again, it comes back. It's true. It's it's enormous for an individual to carry a pain. I mean, it's for a parent or grandparents to lose a child that's enormous you can't yeah. do it alone. there's no way that can be grieved on no. as no. an individual and but that's that, that uh, it goes back to your question i'm remembering it now thank you uh, how do we do this how do we restore some sense of grief and gratitude and um but that's part of the problem isn't it i mean the, we're we're sentenced to solitary confinement around our grief you have to do with it alone and most of the grief we carry, we cannot face alone. So then we strategically have to shut down, close the heart, become numb, or find other means of distraction, you know, dissociation. I often say the two primary sins of Western culture are amnesia and anesthesia. We forget and we go numb. And we go numb because of what we've forgotten. Oh, wow. So we, this is the this is the system that we're kind of locked in. The more we forget the primary value of community, so that our our grief has a place to go, right? I mean that when we when we hold grief rituals, sometimes we have people coming from Australia, from England, and from Canada, and all across the country, and it's wonderful that they come. But that's at the heart of our sorrows, isn't it? This profound sense of loss and forgetting that you have to travel eight thousand miles for the privilege of weeping next to another human being. This should be happening in every community, you know, at least monthly, if not more. But we don't have that. So, you have, you know, that that is part of why we don't trust grief. We're so incredibly inhospitable to grief when it comes around. And we rarely have a pure grief moment. We have what I call a grief panic moment. That because we're asked to face it alone, because we have no education, in the etiquette of grief, so that when it arises, I just don't feel grief, I feel panic. Like this is gonna destroy me, it's gonna overwhelm me, I'm gonna drown, you know? And because we don't have the containment fields for that, we can't say to our friends, let's get together, I, I, need, I need to be held. Well, you can't confess that. You have to do it alone. We live in a very heroic culture and the hero has very narrow range of motion. It has to be successful in control, 
always rising. We love things rising in this culture, you know, whether it's GDP or penises or whatever, but it's always got to be going up. But grief takes us down, doesn't it? The direction of sorrow is to our knees. It's to the ground. It's to the earth. And that panics us because we have no trust in the depths. We have no trust in darkness and in the, in the, in the earth itself. You always have to be successful. And that means getting over your grief as fast as possible. And psychology has done a terrible job of colluding with this agenda, you know, pathologizing grief after, what is it, four weeks, six weeks now? I can't remember how. They had to negotiate to get that much time before it was considered a clinical disorder, you know, before you medicate it or you, um, but I have found a profound sense of faith in grief and what it does to restore not only our sense of participation and belonging, but also to repair this, this, uh, the network of kinship um, between humans and more than humans. And it's indispensable. And I heard you say somewhere very beautifully that the more we grieve, the more we can love, actually. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm... I, you know, when we do, at the end of the grief ritual, uh, I usually do a closing prayer as we are all standing there together, just kind of like watching this incredible shedding of weight, and we're all in the room radiant. I often say, you know, we didn't do this just for ourselves. We didn't do this just so we felt better. We did this so we can love the world more ardently, so our love can fall out into the streets. And the young ones can feel not so alone, but they can be seen by old codgers like me, you know, that we can look at the world and, and, and greet it with gratitude. So our hearts can become more and more generous. So there's a profound relationship between love and, and grief. And the more we allow grief to flow, yeah, as you said, yeah, our, our love just quickens. And uh, yeah, we love it. Yeah, I remember the, and we live in the same area. What I felt during the big fires we experienced here, yeah. here where there was so much loss um, on every level, that there was something that changed in the community, softened. People were looking more in each other's eyes. We were mobilized, and there was more sense of community through that yeah. shared grief. Really invited us to to that. I, it was palpable. And then, of course, yeah. it was gone afterwards. Um, gone, but not forgotten, I think. You know, um, yeah, I think what I've seen is that uh, collectively, and particularly where there's been traumas like this, that the denial is cracking, right? That what's happening is that whether it's ecologically, economically, culturally, we're seeing that things are in trouble. And the denial structures, the capacity to deny it, are becoming less and less uh, capable of keeping the separation between what's happening and, and what's real. So we then, we then enter what I call the commons of the soul. So after the fires, yes, they, we were definitely in the commons of the soul. We all were affected. The pandemic did something similar. Now, no one is immune anymore. A fantasy of immunity is collapsing every day. And we can think, well, that's an iceberg way the hell over in you know Antarctica. Well, no, it's raising the sea levels and it's causing refugees you know, migrations and it's causing droughts. And you know, so there is there's no sense of separation anymore. And the grief work that we have to do as a consequence of that is is very important. Because that's that will be the means by which we find our our again our, our commonality our our kinship with one another, love and grief, eternally entangled. Beautiful. And maybe just one question before we also bring the community in. Uh, I was when I heard the word emptiness at the beginning, without even pausing, I immediately linked it to the Buddhist notion of emptiness. So I wonder how, um, which leads eventually to the deep interconnect. It points that there is not 
a separate inherent exactly. value in in objects mm. or or phenomena. So I wonder how your approach to emptiness connects or not to the Buddhist notion of emptiness. No, I really love that that idea um, because it really does help to loosen the straitjacket of identity. You know, to to begin to really imagine that my sense of self is inseparable from your sense of self. Is to empty enter into that Buddhist sense of emptiness. That this construct of self is fictitious. There is no self separate from sun. There is no self separate from moon. There is no self separate from starfish. You know that. So you know that that fits beautifully in with how I try to approach this because again the, the means of responding to the emptiness isn't to try to fill it, right. but to restore our relationships, to fall back out. As Robinson Jeffers says, we must fall in love outwards. You know, to, to have our, our, our feelings of kinship fall back out into the world. And so, yeah, that uh, the emptiness in both senses of that, of, that, of that word, whether it's the emptiness that comes with individualism and se separation from the world, or the emptiness that restores our our entryway back into it's like you know the front and back of the same imaginal territory you know we need we need that that imagery from buddhism and we need to be able to approach our own emptiness with that wider sense of what what is this leading me back toward rather than how do i avoid it you know again trust in the symptom there's something in the symptom that soul is trying to address. But maybe just in bring us to some shared awareness of our interbeing, a poem, or anything that feels appropriate for such a short period of time. Sure. So we can leave this um, more connected. Or... Well, let's just have everyone close your eyes just for a second. And just allow yourself to drop into your body presence and to the, what we've been sharing today, this field that we've been sitting in, swimming in, dreaming in, sharing in. And in your imagination, imagine filaments extending out to everything that you love. Imagine the filaments moving from your heart out to the ground beneath you, to your grandkids, to a beloved friend, to a beloved animal friend, to a pasture nearby. Just let your heart extend these filaments of affection and love. And feel your relatedness to all these others. And now for a moment, imagine all the filaments coming to you from all that loves you. Star clusters and the moon, ancestors, shaggy your dog, all that love you, feel that. Feel your entanglement with all the beings around you. Now with your in-breath, draw in being loved, and with your out-breath, extend your love to the world, mm -hmm. to all that you love. In-breath, held by love, out-breath, offering your love. And let this place be a place to return to when grief arises, when fear arises, when loneliness arises, when the emptiness is present, offer this. You are held. It's a sweet poem by Sophia de Mellabrainer. She said, I'm listening, but I don't know if what I hear is silence or God. I'm listening, but I can't tell if what I hear is the plane of emptiness echoing 
or a keen consciousness that at the ends of the universe deciphers and watches me. I only know I walk like someone beheld, beloved, and known. And because of this, I put into every movement solemnity and risk. Let's walk solemnly. Let's take risks. Let's remember what the soul yearns for. Let's come back to the world and to one another. We've been alone far too long. Thank you. Mm. Wow. wow. Thank you, Francis. Thank you for this journey of remembering. You're so welcome. Bring it's a place forward. I like to travel. Yes. Thank you, Zaya. Thank you, Mary Shio. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of sand content, available exclusively to sand members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify and share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.